Lecture. On the panel, we have Cosmos Metaxas from Greece, Australia, wherever he feels like. Chad Kasson from who? Really? Uh, Jerome Saba, uh, New York, I think. Dre, I forget where you live, not that it matters. And Nick Doshi. And take it away. Great. Thanks for the intro, Bill. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time out of your busy day to come to the tape panel. So let's just take a little quick brief survey. So how many out there have a real-to-real -real tape deck now? Awesome. We've got a lot of hardcore people. How many are thinking about getting into tape? Yay. Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll help you there. How many just came to see the freaks that are into tape and they want to stay away from <laughs> okay. Great. So why don't we just do a quick brief introduction. Let's start with Costas and just give us a little brief background and then we'll move on. Uh, can you use the microphone? Uh, I think you probably need to really rough a little bit worse. Is that better? Can you hear me? Everyone, can you hear me? Is that fair enough? Or I might just use this one. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I'm not too sure if people know, the company's been going for about 40 years, uh, always crazy with tape. My first references were uh, tape reporters from Stellarbox, and I was using those 40 years ago. And I still use them, I actually still have them. Um, and um, then about, say, almost eight years ago, I decided to do a, a new tape recorder because I think the technology was available. And so basically we also make tape recorders. Everybody knows Chad, so that's kind of... Oh. I'm Chad Carson, and uh, I own Acoustic Sounds, and we, because of people like Miles and David Robinson and, and all their followers, all our customers, they, they wanted tape, and they wouldn't leave me alone. And just, <laughs> when you're doing tape, when you're doing tape, so we finally did some, it's been fun. <laughs> Sounds awesome, everybody's enjoying it, and we'll continue as long as you support it, so. Oh, Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jerome Sabag, I'm a jazz musician, I play saxophone. Uh, I've been recording the tape for about 20 years, uh, playing with records, didn't necessarily make it out on tape as a medium uh, for you guys to listen to. But that's changing because I, uh, I'm putting out tape now and I'm starting a record label called Analog Tone Factory. Uh, that's the record that I did on tape, which is called Vintage. And uh, the idea is to uh, put out all analog vinyl, but also uh, tape. Uh, it sounds great, and I'm heartened to see that there's some support for it out there. So, it's great. Hi, I'm Andre Jennings, uh, staff or senior writer for the Action Sound. Been writing for about a decade now. Uh, been into tape for almost a decade. Uh, have several machines. My background is in engineering, uh, digital hardware design, processors, interfaces, and whatnot. But um, my fun is analog, which is uh, mostly tape and uh, vinyl. That's where I, uh, I relax when I come home from work. Last, last but not least, I'm Nick Doshi. Um, I don't know exactly what I'm doing here, but <laughs> so I remember making my first tape recording when I was nine years old using my father's really stereo tape recorder. Kind of been hooked ever since. Uh, have a background in broadcast engineering and radio and television systems design. Uh, started Doshi Audio in 2006. Um, and uh, in early 2012, I started bringing a uh, tape preamplifier to shows just so that you know, folks who are visiting the shows don't ever get a chance to hear a different format and so on. Would have some fun. And that grew uh, into where uh, one of my products is a tape preamplifier design to be used with different transports. And, um, you know, so we've kind of followed the evolution of this hobby for all of folks as, uh, as an active participant. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy. Okay, thanks, Nick. Nick's being rather modest. He makes a really awesome tape stage. So, anyway, I thought just to put a little 
things in a little bit of perspective. It's going to look a little at, at a retrospective look at what we've done in the past for Tate Pass. So it's actually really cool. Um, but as we're going through it, what I want everybody to think about first and focus on as we hear all the panelists talk is the ceiling. And what ceiling is what I'd like to make analogy to an athlete. An athlete has a floor, they have a ceiling. How high is that ceiling of performance? And I think when we talk about tape, that's really what we're talking about. So when we talk about that ceiling, we can think about it either as a recording level, either at the tape machine level, or just at simply the format level. So, you know, really important thing just to keep in mind as we go through things. So I found these in my computer. I thought they'd be really funny. The, picture on the left there is the two people who started it all, Dan Schmally and Paul Stubblebine from the Tate Project. I think this is about, it might be 2014 at the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and they were in their room and I got pictures of the two of them and you know they started the Tate Project. They went back to the, their forum and it looks like it was first started in 2007. Yeah, I think I did my first review of their tapes in 2008, 2009. So people thought they were crazy. You know, they were loony, they lost their marbles. I mean, who's gonna to listen to that? And you know, anybody that did, all of a sudden was pretty gobsmacked at what they heard. Um, the other panel is another from the Rocky Mountain. That was the very first tape uh, panel we ever had, headed up by Charlie King, who's in the sort of orangey red shirt. And Charlie, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but he's done a few of the tape panels. He's done tape, preamp of King Cello. So yeah, that was kind of funny. That was about 2014. We had one here about the same time. Um, you know this fellow, this was him introducing his tapes at Rocky Mountain. And we talk about duplication and this was Chad's early tape duplication. You can see with his ATR machine there. So you know it's not something like machines where you just you know records you just stamp them out. Here you have it with the machines. I think at that time we had four ATRs, I think he's expanded that to what, eight now? Okay, 11, wow, okay. So, you know, he can make 11 copies at one time. It's huge in the tape industry, they laugh at you with the record industry, but, you know, we're talking about quality here. And this is just another tape duplication from Rene Laflamme, who does Nagra, you can see all the beautiful Nagra machines there, the Nagra T there, and the four S's that he uses. And he makes really awesome tape copies too. And I just put this up, people say, well, you know, who's releasing music on tape? Well, now it's probably 30 or more labels that are releasing their outstanding, <coughs> obviously Chad's 2X HD, which was Renee's we just talked about, Analog Tone Factory, that's Jerome's new label, um, Audio Knox out of Italy, they make really awesome tapes they've been in delving into like the Proprius catalog. Um, if you'd like Jazz at the Pawn Shop, they released that. Um, we also have Groove Note that's doing amazing recordings. Porch House, who's here, who, if you go up to their room, I think it's 1520, uh, 421, 1521. Um, they've got some of their tapes on display. There's a sampler tape. International Phonograph, that's Jonathan Horwich, who's from Chicago, who does really excellent jazz recordings. We have Opus 3 that's making copies of their own recordings, the Tate Project who started it all. Um, and another one who makes really great classical and some jazz stuff is Jarlon, based out of LA. So they're all really great stuff to get on tape. They all have really great offerings. Okay, so we're gonna save that one for the end. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go through a couple of quick different topics that I think would be of interest to people of all different, you know, experience in tape. So um, we kind of got into it a little bit how people got into tape. I thought we'd also start next with just what was the first real-to-real -real tape deck machine that you guys owned? Yeah, you can start with Cost. And basically, when I was uh, started off in the audio business, I was using some very expensive turntables. And someone said to me, you should have a tape recorder. And this is in the early 80s. So I did my research, it was Nagra and then, and Stellarox in Switzerland, in that part of Switzerland, French part. So I went and visited them both, saw the Nagra T, the Nagra 4S, and then compared that with uh, George Kelly's Stellarox. 
And so that, I just fell in love with the Stella box. I fell in love with his mentality. And so back then, I bought a TD9, which is the big machine, which does everything, and the small SM8. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to go out and record. So, but this was, you're talking now, mid 80s. And back in the mid 80s, when someone saw a tape recorder, even then they thought you were nuts. So, uh, you know, and later, people didn't even know what a tape recorder was. So, so the concerts that I do, because I've been doing concerts since the mid 80s, um, and uh, I've done more than 300 concerts with Stellarbox machines, and that's where I come from. Um, people honestly didn't understand what you need this thing for, what is it for in this digital world. So basically that's how I started, and when I heard the Stellarboxes, I did a, my first recording, which was at Geelong Grammar School, that's Grammar School, because back then, who's going to give you the chance, um, and played it back, it was to die for. And uh, that's when I realised this is it for me. So that's how I started. Okay, Chad. I had a, I think it was a TA, TNR, yeah. for sure, it was a consumer model. I had that way back when. But uh, then the first real tape machine we bought was probably an ATR. It was a 102. And then now we've got mid, you know, MCIs and ATRs and uh, studios and a little Stella box. You had the machine called you inherited from Doug Sachs. Yeah, I got uh, some custom tube electronics MCI ones. And, uh, you know, I've got that little bitty, pretty little Stella box. That thing is nice looking, <laughs> but um, it's it's pretty. But the the workhorses are the ATRs. And you see Betty in the audience; she's really helped us out through the years. And we've got a mastering ATR deck that we can cut records from with the preview head. And we have um, an MCI that's a mastering deck, tubes from Doug. And we have two mastering uh, studio, I think it's A8, and that's what we have now. But I started with a little TX, so there you go. Uh, the first tape recorder I used was in the studio, and those were ADR 102, because they're pretty common uh, on the East Coast, for sure. So I did a few records with those. <laughs> then a friend of mine, my partner in the label, Pete Randy, uh, got a MPEX 351, which is a late 50s, early 60s uh, tube machine. So he has it in quarter inch, and we started using it, and I was like, oh, this thing really sounds great. So this kind of led us down the path of getting another MPEX, which we converted to half inch 1530 IPS operation, and that's what we've been using uh, for the record vintage, which I just uh, put out a few months ago and the next ones and to us those electronics sound particularly good uh, and in combination with the half inch transport and 30 IPS operation like that really works for us uh, and another uh, great part with that is that these record these uh, tape machines come in two parts the transport is like one big suitcase the electronics are another big suitcase and there's wire between them, so they're actually portable, which means you could go to a jazz club, uh, great sounding space, uh, a studio if you wanted to, and you could bring it, and that's what we've done. All right, well, looks like we're doing more than just our first tick deck. <laughs> Everybody here, so I'll, I'll rattle off some for you here real quick. Um, my first tick deck, thanks to Miles, another friend of mine, his name is Mark Pearson, and Key Choi. I don't know if you guys know who Key Choi is, but he's kind of the guru of, of tape, tape machines. Uh, those guys really got me into tape. Um, and at, at that point, I decided to, uh, to dive in. I kind of dove, dove in uh, right away with a uh, uh, MTR-10, which is an Atari MTR-10, a two-track uh, studio mastering uh, deck. Uh, runs 15 IPS and 30 IPS. And those are the two speeds that I mostly run uh, tapes at. After that, kind of uh, snowballed. I picked up a pair of uh, Studer AA20s, uh, mastering decks, so I completely refurbished those and uh, got them working and uh, had John French re redo my heads for me, uh, relap the heads. Um, then as 
Stellarbox SD7, which uh, Charles King redid the electronics for me. Uh, French did the heads, and um, a Revox G36. I did a full restore that on, my, on that one myself. Um, and then a Studer A, uh, BU Mark II. Uh, I did that one, and then I picked up a Nagra 4S. And the last one that I have uh, is a Revox A700, which I kind of like because it's uh, it's got a, uh, a nice uh, transport on it that's very similar to the uh, B67. Uh, in fact, they are identical. And then uh, the A10 uh, has a similar uh, type of transport also on it. And that's, that's a nice machine when you can get it up and running, uh, which I've managed to do. Hopefully it'll continue that way. So uh, for now, that's what I got. If my wife tells me eight is enough. If you remember that TV show, uh, <laughs> that's about it for me uh, right now. Okay, for the next two hours, I'm going to talk to you about the table <laughs> shoes. Um, so I, uh, you, you know, um, I started as a recording engineer. I went to this, uh, I spent a year at the Institute of Audio Research getting a diploma in recording technology. Um, and so the first machines I actually worked on were the studio machines, Ampex, Ampex. Twos, um, you know, various tutors, etc. The first tape machine I actually owned was an A700, a Studer A700, uh, kind of like uh, uh, Andre has. And, uh, and then subsequently, uh, many have come and gone, including several Sony APR 5000 series machines, a couple of Otaris, um, countless Studers. Uh, because of my association with each oil, it's not uh, kind of inescapable. But uh, currently at home, uh, I use two Studer A80s. Uh, one's a DA, one is an RC, one is a half inch uh, transport, one is a quarter inch. And then for uh, shows and traveling around, I have a Studer A810. So, so those are the machines I have. I have others, various uh, and sundry. Thanks, Nick. Well, you know, compared to all those guys, I'm kind of slumming. I just am using a Techniques 1506 that Nick uh, modded for me and John French. And basically all that's left from it is the transport, which has been modified a bit, and uh, new tape heads, super low inductance, plugs, magnetic heads, and Nick's wire balanced out to his tape stage. So that's where I'm kind of at um, in my tape journey. Um, I like the machine because it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Living in New York, it's great. Maybe I'd love an 880 in my living room, but there's just no space for it. And I think my cats would be living on it besides that. So let's move on. So we're going to get the next. You know, Costas is Miles. doing a new machine, but. Miles, oh. can I interject just one? Uh, so he, Miles brings up a very important point. A number of you raised your hands about what you were thinking about getting a tape, and I just didn't want to let the opportunity pass by. Um, a well put together, a well refurbished Techniques 1500 series machine has impressive specifications. And if you're looking for a small format deck, there's uh, uh, Jake Porter, uh, you know, rebuilds them and so on. It's an isolated uh, transport that is gently on tape, gently on tape heads, and it's capable impressive uh, results. Yeah, it's pretty much plug and play. You know, you don't have to worry about everything. You just kind of spool it up and hit play and you're, you're off to the races. So what I wanted to go to next is talking a little bit about the older tape decks first. And I wanted to kind of make this a two-part question for the panelists. So, you know, first is, you know, what is special about these old machines that relates to their performance? Um, and then the second thing is, you know, something we haven't kind of touched on in the past, which is, you know, we always compare a tape deck to a turntable. Turntable is a cartridge, it has a tone arm, and it has a transporter or drive system. So with the tape deck, we've got the same sort of thing. We've got the transport, we've got the tape heads, and we've got the drive. So, you know, I would, you know, maybe people could touch a little bit on both and talk about, you know, in terms of importance, 
which they feel is more important, the drive, the heads, the electronics, and you know, what are sort of the things that you hear by improving each of those parts of the, of the tape recorder? Well, um, interesting question, Miles. Uh, I would say that um, I was using a little Stellarox, which I modified for quite a few years. And for me, I was trying to chase the high-end sound because the other problem with a lot of the old machines is they were never really meant for high-end sound. They were meant for, you know, really rough broadcast use where they were hammered 24 hours a day. They were then recalibrated daily or every two days. So they were workhorses, and all these machines we've talked about are mostly are workhorses. And um, sadly, the absolute best machines that were made in the past were done in the 60s. And uh, those machines were very simple, very purist, and that's why they're still coveted today. Then after that, the commerciality became uh, more important. Um, what I find when you're asking the question about what's more important, the heads, the electronic, obviously the ensemble is important. That's first and foremost. But sadly, in a lot of the big companies that we've talked about, uh, you would find that the actual guys doing the electronics were a whole different department to the guys who were doing the mechanics. And they never worked together. They just, the, you know, the, the electronics guy said, give me the bloody thing to turn, and I'll give you the spec for NAB or IEC or whatever. And no one was listening. And so that's why, you know, the best decks from some of these companies were some of the older decks. Um, now, of course, what, I, what I've tried to do, because I do both, I do both the mechanics and the electronics, and starting with the Stellar Box as my starting point, what I found was when you're able to play with both at the same time, it's unbelievable what you can do. Uh, but it's a tuning, it's really a tuning. You know, the, the suspension of the, the way the actual tape goes through the, the, the heads and all that is one thing. Just calibrating there is another thing. Uh, and then of course, the, the motors, how you do what you do. It's like, for example, with a lot of turntables, people don't realize how important regulated supplies, what difference it makes, you know, changing parts, what it makes. So it's, if you're in a position like I'm being in a very lucky position where you can actually, you know, do everything, you can then, you know, really understand what works and what doesn't work. And that's been, uh, from my experience, you have to listen. And that's, again, something which, uh, luckily now, you know, people get that, you know, and, and what is ironic is that tape is the ultimate medium, but, you know, it was never treated like high end. You know, that's the, that's the thing. And the machines you hear today now, the studios and all this, unless they've been modified, forget it. They sound pretty average. So that's the thing, that's important. Uh, that, you know, the electronics get looked at, the uh, mechanics get looked at, the heads get looked at, and then you've got a chance to have a great sounding machine. I think what you said also, this is going to apply to what Chad says, these machines have survived now 50 years. They're built like tanks. And when you're in a position like Chad where you're doing tape duping, you want to know every time you go and do the duping, they're going to work. You don't want to have them breaking down and stuff. So, you know, I think their durability is like, to me, is amazing. I, I'm astounded by that. Yeah, but we know now, Chad, when he's listening, he knows what high end audio is. He knows if his recordings sound like this, it's over. He's not going to sound anything. So he's in a fortunate position where we've, you know, we've really evolved a lot in the last 20, 30 years. And with that information, with that knowledge, now the recordings you can get are incredible. Someone was saying to me just uh, here at the show that, um, you know, people were doing recordings back in the 60s and the 70s, for example, and no one's even really heard how good they are because the record electronics were always a lot simpler and a lot better than the playback electronics. And so nowadays, we're in the fortunate position that we hear some of these master tapes from the 60s. Uh, they're mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing, we, only because of their simplicity. They didn't sort of overdo shit back then. Okay, Chad. Now, I forgot the question. <laughs> I mean, it was a long question. It was the question, like, how important is the hairs versus. Right. The, 
You know, the, I mean, always in, in any audio, the, the equipment, I mean, every every part of it's important, you know, and, it, and it's always as good as the weakest link. And um, so it's all important. I don't know which one is, seems like whatever's the closest to the beginning is always to me. What do you think made it so special? If you deal with the master tapes, you hear them up close and personal. What made the tape machine so special? Yeah, right. I mean, you know, back back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, it seems like they had the best engineers that seemed like they really uh, were real serious back then about everything. And, uh, it, you know, America was at its best back in those days, and so were the other countries, it seemed, that they really made some fantastic stuff that still is hard to beat now, you know, I'm, I'm sure. If they put the same kind of money and effort now as they did back then, we could surpass what they did. But I don't think too many people are willing or have the money. There's not enough people buying this stuff to to really go in and and, and to try to you know, make you know not that many people are going to buy it if they make it. It's not going to work financially, I don't think. But. Man, you can take the old stuff and have some of these, you know, people modify it or keep it running and get the best heads. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an interesting thing that people will get people back into this. I'm going to change the, 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 the uh, I'm, not, I'm not answering the question anymore, but I just find it fascinating that, you know, People are really excited about this. They're getting into it, more and more people, and, and it's fun. But I would still think that more people would be into it, you know what I mean? Like, and it's so, because you're just getting, and people might ask me, well, you know, you have a record pressing plant, you manufacture records, why would you want to compete with yourself? You know, you're telling everybody records are the ultimate, the best sound you could possibly get, and you know, why would you want to uh, compete with that or, or and I think they both have their own place. You know, one's a little bit more convenient. I mean, it is amazing sometimes when we are playing a really good tape copy versus a really good master LP, both at the best level. The highest, the best tape you can do, the best record. And if it's a really good turntable, it's amazing how good the record can be to the tape. But they're different. But the but a lot of times they'll be playing, you know, a thirty, forty thousand dollar turntable with a fifteen thousand dollar cartridge. You know, so you know, people will see a fifteen thousand dollar tape machine and they'll be like, Oh, why is it so expensive? That's expensive and you're like, wait a minute, look at this beast, you know, I mean this is you're buying a cartridge for fifteen thousand, you know, this is like a machine that lasts fifty years. And it's got a lot of a lot of money in, into it. But anyway, we're, we're just hoping this thing continues. We, we really love everything about it. People are asking us for a seven and a half inch. And we're trying to figure out how to do that right now, which is kind of complicated. I mean, I know we're into the ultimate, but if we really want to make this thing happen for the, for the public, there's so many of the TX out there, the Kai's out there, that people, those people would love to hear some good quality tape. And they could use their tape machines. I don't know, it looks like it's a little bit more hassle than we're gonna be able to get into, but we've been investigating it, so. Well, I think at the beginning, you know, we talked about that, and it's come up obviously recently, you know, about seven and a half. And I think in the beginning, it was just gearing up to do one. You couldn't do both well, but now you kind of have the 15 sort of down, and, you know, you've got your system set up. Now it's kind of like, okay, can we maybe move on and do something? Well, I just think, it, you know, for this this hobby to grow, with so many people having those, you know, uh, Kai's and TX's, Pioneers. Pioneers just sitting around, they would love to have something to play, you know what I mean, to play with. And there's just so many machines that I think it would really, but when you start asking people to get into the, you know, the, the tapes that go in both directions. I mean, and man, it gets complicated, you know, and 
It'd be nice if you could find some heads that were inline heads that you could put on those T acts so we could just record it, you know, two track in one direction. But I don't think there's that many heads. Is anybody making heads like that? Yeah. There is? Yeah, French Who? will make French. John French? French and Flux Magnetics will make you a, a quarter inch, quarter inch four track head that will auto reverse. Okay, I'll talk to him. You bet. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I'm sorry to take it off, but it just seemed like it. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of really uh, interesting points uh, that Chad was making. Uh, about the seven and a half thing, I'm actually looking at that too, because I think it would make sense to have tape that would be less uh, expensive, because let's face it, right now it's expensive. Uh, and there's good reasons for uh, why it's expensive, because blank tape is already very expensive. So that's one thing I'm looking at too, and I think it could be a way to get more people into it. Uh, as far as machines and the original question, uh, I think there was a huge uh, research and development budget for all these machines. I mean, everybody was recording the tape. That was the only way that people recorded. Digital didn't, didn't come until much later. For So for a long time, like major corporations and companies were investing a lot of money into making these tape recorders as good as they could possibly be. Uh, now, as, as a matter of taste, I know that personally I gravitate more towards uh, the sound of tubes than solid state, and I think that's also the difference. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Like the next record that I did, uh, we tracked it. it was, it's a live to two track record, which means you mix it on the fly on the mixing board uh, down to stereo, and that gets sent to whatever you're storing it on. So, and we did it straight to digital, and we did it to the studio uh, A820 that was in the studio, and we did it to the Ampex 351 machine that I mentioned earlier. And both machines were 30 IPS half inch tape. And if you listen to all three versions, they sound different, uh, and to me, both tape recorders sound a lot better than the straight digital and sound a lot truer to the spirit of the music and the way we sound in the studio and the way we play in the room. To me, it's a much better representation. And then if you go Studer versus Ampex, to me, I prefer listening to the Ampex. And I think uh, the Studer has got a much more sophisticated transport. Uh, it's definitely, it's got more guides. It's more accurate. So definitely the Studer wins on that front, but in terms of listening to the music, if you sort out your Ampex transport, which is a pretty crude, primitive transport in some ways, if you sort it out well to where it's working really well, then you got, as Chad uh, said, or Costa said that, like like simple electronics that are like not too much, uh, too many bells and whistles in the way, and they sound really great. Uh, and case in point. So many classic records were made on these uh, machines, and we're still listening to them today. And Chad is reaching them, and they sound great. Uh, so I think that's a, the more you advance in time, the more you get into uh, different sounding electronics, and I think that's a big part of it, personally. Andre, yeah, just getting back to the original question, which was, you know, what makes the older machines um, more Coveted, so to speak. And, and I, I think it boils down to this, there's two things. There are the consumer machines that we, we can get our hands on. Um, and those machines, if they are, you have access to someone, an engineer or a technician who can restore those machines, um, you can get a really good playing machine that can play back tapes for a reasonable amount of money. Now, obviously, the tapes themselves are, are very expensive. But you can you can save some money on some of the machines here. And when we move into the studio decks, um, those those decks, and I have, I have four of the larger ones, the, the Atari, the two studios, or actually three studios. Those machines are workhorses. They are they are especially the studios. Their transports are top notch. Um, the guides are wonderful in them. They have very low uh, wow and flutter numbers that are that are admirable even to today's standards. There's, there's still considered some of the catalog machines that are available. 
when they're in running condition. The good thing about those machines is that they made lots of them, which Nick pointed out earlier when we were just talking about it. And you can get your hands on the parts for them to keep the machines running. Availability of those machines, the longevity of them working, is a good thing. Um, the other piece that Jerome kind of touched on it, which I have in my notes also, which is all that music that we love from the 60s and 70s up into the middle of the 80s, they were recorded on these machines. So obviously these machines were very good. They still are able to record that information and most people aren't getting their hands on the actual session tape. And so from a session tape, which is a multi-track tape, to a mix down tape, you're going through one of these machines in order to get the two track sound. And that's the sound that we're talking about listening to today. And when you move into some of the newer machines, they're wonderful. Some of the newer machines sound great. Obviously, they didn't have the same uh, R&D department that Stewart had or Ampex or Atari. It's, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. So some of the newer machines. <laughs> but, and, I mean, because I, I don't know. Okay, well, that's part of the thing. Miles will get to that section. Um, well, Costas is here. He's got a new machine, but there, there are more things. Um, and Miles will talk about it. Um, but those newer machines are really good. Um, also, but they don't have, they didn't have the resources that some of these larger companies had. And coming from an engineering background, knowing how some of the larger companies work, I don't think we can throw them all into the same bucket of being a stovepipe type organization where one group didn't know what the other group was doing. There is a lot of transfer back and forth in a well-run engineering department. And the director of engineering is extremely responsible for that. And I, and I, and I think there are some situations where there's probably some guy designing the transport and another guy's doing the electronics for the transport you know, the electronic part versus the mechanical part, and they may not talk uh, in some situations. But in the case of Studer and Ampex, I, I, based on what I know, the knowledge of those machines and how they're designed, I, I doubt that was the case. Um, there, there's, there's a seriously complicated system, and these are designs that I've actually designed systems with these electronics before. And I know that you cannot get the mechanics to work properly without interaction between those two departments. And it's a tight interaction, not just the throw of specs over the window um, at each other. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, it's similar to what you would do in space design. Um, however, the newer machines, because they don't have that large R&D budget, their costs are gonna be higher. And so those machines are a lot more expensive, but the benefit you get from them is that it's turnkey, they work, and you can use them and enjoy them you know, over time that you have them. Um, I'm not sure how all of them deal with, uh, you know, longevity and repair and, you know, parts availability into the future, but that's something that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll observe as time goes on. But I, I, I think the hobby has enough in it that all of us, whether it's the older machines, which we, we've discussed about their durability and everything else, but there's, there is, things that you need to be able to do to get these machines back up and running. And it's not an easy idea to do that. No more so than it's an easy idea to build a new machine. You need skilled individuals to either get one or two of those machines working properly. Uh, from that point on, once you've, you've invested in that, you can enjoy those machines for a fairly long time and enjoy them to play your taste with. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So we, we discussed a lot, um, and I just want to make a couple of quick points. Um, as a consumer, you know, I'm sort of going to take this question and turn it around from your perspective. And that is, you know, I've got X number of dollars. I want to try to play around with tape. Tape itself is really expensive. And being in the hobby, we're kind of on this perpetual upgrade path. So, where do you start for your first tape machine, you know, and then where do you want to go? So, you're faced with a choice of, of certain compromises. Obviously, uh, there are a much higher volume of used older tape machines available versus a brand new turnkey device, which is also, you, you know, in, in, in terms of price range, a little bit in the high price range. So focus on the things that will keep 
your tape light already safe. You know, make sure the choices you make um, as far as the tape machines you choose to buy are gentle on tape. They have, you know, they have transports that have decent amounts of server control and so on. So that the expensive, and Chad will disagree with me, but there are tapes that are very expensive. You know, and you want to preserve them as much as you can. So, so from a consumer's perspective, that's what you want to focus on is, you know, the, the sound quality will be part of your upgrade path, but choose a device that is, you know, gentle on your tapes first. And that way you can start the hobby and, and keep moving forward. Uh, and as far as Chad's perspective goes, you know, some of the masters that he touches, um, basically have a few plays left in them. And so that becomes a completely different criteria. It's, you know, how do you play this 1956 master tape or a production master of that, you know, maybe one or two generations later, and, and, and treat it as jerky as possible? And in that sense, you know, where Andre and, and Chad are coming from, it is the sophisticated transports, the BTR 102s, the you know Stinger A twenties that will be the most generic. So those, that's my answer. Cool. Thank you very much. The next subject I wanted to raise something we've never actually done at the tape panel before, but it was actually kind of brought up to me a couple of years ago, maybe now. You know, you always got to add like three or four years with the pandemic, but probably pre-pandemic by Les Brooks. And who's been a, uh, a tape stock historian? He's like, hey, you guys never talk about tape stock. Can I get on the panel and talk about tape stock? And like, I did invite him this time, and he wasn't coming to the show. But that was kind of, you know, I think there are two other things that have come into play. Number one, with this RTM discontinuing the 468 tape, which a lot of people are upset about. Um, and then just very recently, Jerome really letting me in on like doing some tape comparison where he took an outtake and this up coming out and he wanted to hear it on different tape stocks. And this, this grew out of something else we talked about. So, you know, he's brought over, I think, six different tape stocks that we've been able to listen to and compare in my system. One, well, two of them were 468, the older 468, the, well, one was the current 468, the capture tape, this Chinese tape that's come out, ATR tape, I miss you one, Jerome? I think we did, uh, definitely done the uh, 900. The 900, that was the one. So it was really, to me, mind boggling just how much of a difference the tape made. And I say, like, the Chinese tape actually, you know, although it maybe didn't fall, you know, into what the other tapes were doing, it impressed me that, hey, that's not a bad first effort. And, like, hey, maybe if these guys got their act together, they could really do something. It was really interesting. You know, like, one tape was better in the bass, one tape was better in the mid range, this one was a little better in the highs. So, like, you know, and it wasn't like when we went into this, it's like, oh, this is kind of like a, there'll be minor differences. But to me, it was far more than minor differences. So, you know, I, I know Costas has done a lot of recording, Chad's doing stuff, Jerome, you know, Andre, Nick have both recorded. So, I, I'd love to have everybody kind of share their thoughts on, you know, the importance of the tape stock that we record on and duplicate on. Uh, basically, I'm actually still using 468, and um, I bought a whole heap of 468, luckily from RTM before they discontinued it. Uh, but in the last, say, 40 years, when I was working with my cellar boxes, I was always just using 468. And the biggest problem I had in Australia, Melbourne, Australia, was uh, just getting enough of it. So the first thing I did was go to all the recording studios that weren't using tape much anymore and just buy up every pancake of 468 I could. And, but very quickly, I, that ran out too. So then I started doing, for example, and this is a, probably a secret I should share, but, but uh, in America, there was quite a few rolls of seven inch 468 uh, that's been used and re, you know, the demagnetized, etc. So at some point, and this is now, we're talking the early 2000s, when tape was really difficult to get, um, I actually bought a shitload. I'm not too sure if that's American shitload. <laughs> so a buttload of tapes from the States, which cost me a fortune for the transport more than the 
take for themselves. And then I used to just obviously take them, you know, do the old cut and, you know, stick them together. And I had to do that for a lot of tapes. Uh, and in all honesty, at one stage, I'm talking down the late 2006, 2007, I was really worried that I couldn't record on tape anymore because at that stage, I think um, the Dutch company that owned what RTM owns now, uh, they went out of business. Uh, Ampex was doing then GP9, which was awful tape. It was very cardboardy. So I went through a lot of dramas with tape. And I'm talking now, I'm working, I'm sort of using it realistically to do concerts. So that was, again, a big problem. In terms of the sound of different tapes, to be honest, I've sort of started with 468, and I'm very happy with 468. But I don't find that tapes, um, if, you, if they're good tapes, the sound shouldn't be that different. That's why I'm a bit surprised that... Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, in the end, that no matter what, no matter everything we listen to, the 468, whether it was the older 468 or the newer one, still sounded the best. Yeah, that's, that's really goofy. You know, that's what I found all the years. I've been doing it for 40 years. And that's why, thankfully, I've still got 100 468 tapes sitting there. But um, I still can't understand that. That's sort of, you know... And why 468? It's, you know, strange number combination. Yeah, we, we use the 900 as well. That's, that's what we use. You give a good playback, it doesn't matter. Well, we use what we can get. We have to with it. Uh, on the record side, I've used uh, 900 and ATR. Uh, and yeah. on the machine we're working with, I prefer the sound of ATR. So that's kind of what we've been using. Uh, on the duplicating side, yeah, it's true that like there were a lot of we, we ran like six. I've done tests since actually, and it's like they all sound different, and they still they all sound good, but the differences are still there. And it's like everybody tells you they this shouldn't matter, this doesn't make a difference, but you know, I think most of us in this hobby we realize fairly early on that everything kind of does make a difference. And certainly in the recording side, everything makes a difference. And the playback side too. So I, I thought 468 sounded really good. I also thought ATR sounded really good. You can get ATR, you can't get 468. So, you know, you also, as Chad said, you can use what you can get. It's like right now it's 900, uh, 911 ATR, and they all, they all have their uses. Um, it's certainly be good if, we had more choice. Uh, I went from 468 to get back in the mix, and uh, I didn't think personally that like the capture and the Chinese tape were as good. But like maybe you can get there. There's no problem. So there. Um, for for my recording that I've done, a friend of mine has a studio and he does all analog, uh, toothpaste from start to finish. Um, plays the instruments, records an analog to uh, a track, and then mixes on a uh, Class A bias fit uh, custom uh, mixing board and several two sets of electronics. And he uses 468 uh, for his recordings. Uh, when I do any duplications or recordings of analog myself, I use either 468, which I bias for, and I also bias the deck for SM900. Um, in general, 468 to me sounds sweeter. Uh, SM900 has a little more punch to it, um, and I settle on 900. And the reason I settle on 900 is because I don't have 40 years of uh, recording engineer experience, and SM900 has an incredible amount of headroom on it, and so the decks that I use also have a lot of headroom, so I don't have to worry about saturation, as long as the tape is biased properly. And, and that's, on a, in a small segue, that's probably why a lot of people hear um, some differences when they run the tape and they don't rebias the machine or the, the, stop, the tape stop that they have. They'll just run a recording, and so there's an issue with biasing that can occur. And your frequency response will be slightly different because of that, and that may be part of the reason why. But for myself, it's, it's SM900 when I make, a, when I make recordings, when I, I bias for that. It's available and um, it has a headroom. It's 
so I don't have to worry about saturation as much as I would with um, a, a, a takedown. You can't hit quite as hard with the same length. So I do. Because 
I think a lot of people don't want to buy old machines because they know there's a lot of work to fixing them, to playing with them, to worrying about them, etc. Um, in my case, we're building now a third machine, which is like an ATR 100 actually, which is totally pinch rollerless. So we've got machines with pinch rollers, machines without pinch rollers, and this third machine, I'm also looking at actually offering it to manufacturers who want to do the electronics, so they to do it like a deck concept. But I think the most important thing for someone like myself as a manufacturer is if I can come up with a machine that's affordable, meaning, you know, that then it's a bigger market. Because I don't think it's just the tape that's the issue. I think it's, you know, you guys are experts, so you know what you're looking for in machines. And you know when a machine's been kicked to death, or it's got some life left in it. And sadly, I think that's the problem because from what I hear a lot, a lot and a lot of my customers come from people who bought student A 20s for 70,000 and then find it's a dud, stuff like that. And that's very sad. So I think the important thing is you still need to have manufacturers making something new. And one of the fantastic things I wanted to share with you is that luckily right now we've got electronic vehicles. Now what's that got to do with tape recorders? Well, ironically, that's the perfect motor control combination to make a tape recorder. And Studer and Ampex and all these guys, whatever they used to do in the old days, it was all custom because the motors that were industrially available had nothing to do with tape recorders. So right now it's actually an exciting time to do new things because the technology is there. It's available uh, and it's becoming less expensive. So it's just a matter of finding a good motor vendor, like you know, in the old days they would buy thousands of them so they get them at right, the right cost. A good motor vendor and the software and, the, and all that stuff is not too bad. So it's not just the cost of the tapes and the dubs, it's also the cost of the machines and the cost of maintaining a machine. And a lot of people in high-end audio, in all honesty, they don't want to become mechanical engineers. So that's the other problem that I see. Okay, well, I was going to say, um, in order to kind of get this going more and more people interested in it, uh, I think exposure is, uh, it's, it's similar to you know, we're here at this show because we're audiophiles and music lovers for the most part. And someone exposed us to this hobby. And I think the same thing goes with tape. I think exposure to listening to high quality, um, real to real tapes is one way of getting more people interested into this hobby. Um, and then from there, we have to go towards the machines themselves. and. It's no secret that if you're going to get an older machine, you need to either, one, have the chops to deal with it, or two, you know, an engineer or a technician or someone who specializes in getting these machines back up to fully functional. And not just barely functional, because barely functional means you're going to have issues later on that are going to crop up. Get them back to fully functional. Outside of that, if you're dealing with a newer machine, Metaxas makes nice, very nice sounding machines. Um, that are, are uh, that are, uh, I won't say they're affordable, but they are affordable to those who want to invest that kind of money in a machine. Um, and then there's analog audio design with their new machine, which is a TP1000, which is a very nice new machine that's been designed. Also, and you, you have Ballfinger and uh, a couple other individuals that are making new machines. Uh, I'll talk about some, of them, some more of them there, but uh, in order to enjoy this hobby, you need a piece of hardware that works. It's no different than having, you know, a preamplifier and amplifier with a solid state or tubes. If it's breaking all the time, you're not enjoying your music, you're not listening to your music, you're not having fun in this hobby. Same thing occurs with these machines, whether it's a tape machine, a turntable, or a DAC, or any piece of equipment that you have, you need something that's reliable and functional. Okay, thank you. Um, how, how do I address this question? As uh, we are all incredibly busy in our lives, and uh, sometimes our hobby takes a little bit of a backseat, and we find ourselves with fewer and fewer hours to to spend um, listening to music, etc. 
one of the joys of my life, I can only speak personally, is, you know, in the past few months has been, I, I got a copy of the Harold the Harvest book from AP Records, Jillian Welch's, uh, you know, first debut album. And it's a gorgeous book, right? It's just a massive one. And then it was a limited release of tapes. And, you know, um, I'm sitting there listening to it. I build this stuff all day. I'm listening to music all day. But I sat there and listened to it, and, and I was transformed. I was, tra you know, taken to a different place. I was reminded of everything that I love about what it is to listen to music. And so if, if that's what tape can do for you, if, if it demands that concentration and it, and it gives you that in return, then to my mind, it's worth doing. And uh, so I can only encourage Chad and, and you know, Jerome and, and all these guys are, it's a thankless task in most days, but keep doing it. And, you know, the people who, who feel that will, will be there. You know, so that's where I stand. Well, just to piggyback on Nick's thing, I think one, one thing that would really help in terms of growth is the musical genre that's available on it. You know, it's wonderful, we've got jazz and classical, but, you know, truth be told, not 70% of people listen to rock music, and there's a huge clamoring, you know, of people who want rock music. I mean, Chad's out a couple, like Laura Jones, you know, Porch House is now putting out a few, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, if we had more rock available on tape, I think that would make a big impact on, like, people starting to really second think about, like, hey, maybe I really do want to get into it. So on that topic, I just wanted people to give their sort of thoughts on what are a couple of your favorite tapes that you listen to at home that are commercially available. So I actually put together a list of mine. It's not fair <coughs> someone like Chad's got a huge library of tapes and choosing one from Chad is kind of unfair. But what I would put together was a list of if I was going to put together a tape library, what would be some of the tapes I would want to you know, start with. So, you know, top of the list was Witch's Brew that Chad's put out, uh, Shirley Horn, which is done by Renee, which is wonderful. It was actually a Pierre Spray recording that they got the rights to. Everybody knows that Bill Evans rolls the Debbie. It's a tape project that is just like, defines the magic of a live recording. Uh, Nostros, which is a new choral recording from Yarla, which is amazing. Uh, I'm going to correct the yellow because I, the bold indicates that it's a second generation tape, which means it's made right from the master tape. So you can't get any closer than that. And actually, the yellow was taken right from the master tape. Um, Jonathan Horowitz in Chicago. This is an old one from him. Every time I play stuff, I come out with a different favorite one. But there's a Jason Redke Shimmery, um, the one from Opus 3. There, again, is a direct copy. Just like transports you back to the studio, the Eric Bibb. And the last one is an audio file favorite. Everybody knows Composite Domino, <coughs> put out by Audio Nuts in Italy. Yeah. So everybody else, you can throw your tapes into the hat. What are things that you like? If you have to be at home and listen to something, what do you like to choose from your tape library? Ironically, I don't listen to commercial tapes. I listen to my own recordings. In fact, the funny thing is, uh, for me, I've recorded so much tape that I can just listen to my own tapes ad nauseum. Um, not that, of course, it's everyone's taste, but um, thankfully, at least I was there recording it, so I know what it's supposed to sound like. But uh, if you manage to get that lightning in the bottle with some of the tapes, it's just something else. For me, in all honesty, my biggest bliss is when you're sitting as a recording engineer, recording incredibly good musicians. That, to me, is heaven. Absolutely, Emma. and you're trying to catch that to give it back to you, chaps, with all the emotion, with all the heart, with all the passion, and that's the thing. And tape, the simplicity of it. The first few tapes I was doing was just two microphones playing straight, straight into the Stellogs, which of course I had to do some modifications to. And the magic of those tapes, even today, you know, it's just they, it's emotional. It's hard to explain. So I'm not a rock guy, sadly. It's not, never done it for me. But uh, unfortunately, none of them, none of those. I don't even know any of those uh, tracks. But of Chad, course, I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> to hear your favorite mix. <laughs> oh, but you said a while ago, what the question would should have an answer. 
course, the rock and pop is what everybody wants. And that's, the major labels aren't giving that up. We just want to do it. Okay, so I mean, you know, that would really be a big boost to the popularity of tape, for sure, and our sales. Uh, but I mean, you know, the Nora Jones, I thought was gonna sell a whole lot more than it did, because that was the closest thing to the biggest artist that we were able to license. And it really didn't, I mean, it's all all right. And of course, everybody waited till it was gone to call me and cry. You know, we have it for years. And, you know, of course, us humans always wait until it's too late and then call me and cry. But, well, we could, we could buy more. Uh, so, yeah, we would like to get rock pop, you know. We would like to do it in seven and a half. They're not licensing it, you know. Uh, so that's nothing we can do. Plus, the great stuff comes from the major labels. So if the major labels aren't, uh, I mean, once I had the, the license for L.A. Warman, I mean, had a signed contract, we were fixing ready to produce it. And uh, the engineer talked to the band members how I'm doing it. The label contacted me, they said, we don't want to do it. You know, I could, of course, I could have held their feet to the fire, said that you have a signed contract, and then they'd never license anything to me again ever in my life. So I had to say, well, I have a contract, but I'm going to let it go. So, yeah, we would like to do some classic pop. That's what needs to happen. And somebody else said, the machines are very important to, to the success of this. Of course, yeah, that's another thing. As far as what I listen to, man, I, I, you know, we listen so much in the studio while we're making them. You know, when I go home at night, it's to do anything but listen. You know, it's, I do it all day long. I mean, I'm lucky to be able to do that, and I love doing it. When I go home, I don't really listen to too much music. And again, we hear a lot of like what the tapes are duplicating or, or recording is what, what I listen to. And that's basically, you see the list. Yeah. But I mean, those tapes that, that Shirley Horn, that's a nice record that, that guy, uh, the audio font label did, and, uh, which is rude, it's great, for sure. But uh, anyway. Well, I'll be honest, I don't listen to tape at all because it costs too much money. <laughs> but, uh, I make them, but I don't have it at all. I listen to plenty of music on, on vinyl and, and all sorts of things. Um, I, I, just a couple of things I wanted to say. Like As far as getting into it, I do think that when tape is well made, uh, regardless of musical genre, whatever you're into, like if you get a chance to listen to tape, like I think a few rooms here have it, it is really kind of the ultimate format. It is really kind of better. It is really closer to, there's like an ease to it and a flow to it that I find hard to get anywhere else. Although, you know, I think vinyl is also super great. So it's like, I think that's, but that's a more realistic kind of mass market proposition. Uh, but it's definitely worth seeking out if you can go to a room that has it and experience it for yourself. And as far as the rock pop thing, um, one of my goals, uh, if this label that I'm starting is going to take off, is to expand it beyond jazz and actually record classical music and also uh, pop rock. And if we could do that, then uh, that's also hopefully a blueprint for living artists in different genres to try to create new music and get it out there. So you got the classic, uh, all the classics are out there, and I understand the struggle of licensing that stuff because, yeah, the major labels don't want to give it up and don't want to let you use it, which is too bad. But there's also plenty of people uh, creating new music today, and uh, hopefully there's a way and uh, an economy model that can work um, uh, so we can have all this great music on tape and, and that includes uh, rock and pop for sure. Okay. I've listed just a couple here, uh, some favorites that I uh, like to listen to or, or share with individuals. Uh, one is a Yarlung 
records they have uh, tape, uh, the Frederick Rosselet. It is very, very good. I, I really like that tape. Uh, Chad's uh, Stokowski Hungarian Rhapsodies. That's a that's a wonderful tape. If you have the album, <laughs> you should hear the tape. It is it is spectacular. Uh, Opus Three. Uh, they have a large catalog. They have a sampler tape. Uh, volume number two of their sampler tape is really good. It gives you a nice variety of a lot of different artists that are on the Opus Three label, and that tape sounds fabulous. Also, uh, Phone Nanny. I had a uh, uh, Fino Ritchie, I had him uh, send me one of the tape, and, and it's 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 a favorite album of mine. It's called uh, Homage to Roma, and it's uh, Mai Wong Chung doing um, Italian in uh, Algiers, which is a wonderful. So it's a classical piece, but it's it's not something that'll put you to sleep. It is it is exciting to listen to, um, and he has it he has that on tape, and I ended up buying the tape, and it sounds spectacular uh, from him. And then um, closer to home here in Chicago is International Phonograph Incorporated, and that's uh, John Corwitz's uh, label. And he puts out tapes, and his tapes are direct copies of the master most times if you get the order in when he initially offers them. And uh, mostly he does jazz and some avant garde jazz, but at one point he recorded a big band called the Fat Babies, and that is a fun tape to listen to. I really like that tape. Okay, let's wrap it up with the end. Yeah, so I have uh, quite a few chats with me since the Rock Corner House and uh, the Muddy Waters being amongst my favorites to listen to. Uh, I know we're going to be asked to wrap it up. I just want to mention uh, a couple of names that, uh, that, that we will talk to and we'd be remiss if we didn't bring them up, uh, at least here on today's panel. First one is Tim Parvacini, and the second is Mike Spence. We learned a lot from them, and uh, we ought to say their name at least once. So, thanks. Cool. Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you all for